Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the first series of webinars that will be organized by Trachos during the next days. We need here to keep customers, friends, and industry colleagues together in this uh, My name is of Chatos Limited, responsible for the ports and maritime business unit at the Tratos Group. Even though remote uh, work is a part of our daily life, this is the first webinar that we do, so I'm pretty sure that we will meet your uh, understanding if any technical uh, problem happens during the next uh, minutes. Today, we are glad to bring you an interesting debate on challenges ahead for ports, terminals, and related technologies. And we will count with the participation of uh, senior Tratos personnel, as well as uh, two internationally renowned guest speakers who I'm going to introduce all of them to you now. We will count with uh, Dimitrios uh, Pachakis from uh, OWI UK Limited, Otto Popesco, president of Pima, and from Tratos, we will have uh, Rainer Poleman speaking from Germany and the CEO of the group who will be making the closing remarks, Maurizio Rajani. So let's not wait further. And I'm going now to introduce in detail the first speaker who is going to speak about civil infrastructure on automated terminals. And I'm going to pass the word to Dimitrios Pakakis, which is technical, who is a technical director, Marine Foundations UK, port planning expert, more than 20 years of research and working experience in port planning, engineering and operation modeling. Expertise in port and container terminal planning, operation analysis and simulation, technical and operational due diligence. Dimitrios is a PhD in civil engineering for Stanford University in California, USA, and he accounts companies like Moffat and Nicole in the USA and UK, Rogel Haskonen, and currently he is the technical director of uh, Kowi UK Limited. So Dimitrios, I'm going to give you the word. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, but it's, uh, for me, it's a window to the world from my little office in London. Uh, and then uh, with me, I have a small presentation uh, that uh, thinking about the current situation and uh, previous work I've done in automated container terminals, I thought I wrote down a few notes and a few thoughts, which I'll share with you. And then um, afterwards, I'll have a discussion at the end or ask uh, some questions. So I bear with me as I will connect the PowerPoint to the uh, screen and hopefully I'll be able to share my screen. So uh, I'll move this now here. So hopefully soon you should be able to see the whole, the whole um, screen. I hope that's okay. Um, and you can all see my first uh, slide here. As we said, the, the talk is about civil infrastructure and automated terminals, which is something I had uh, the luck to, to be involved uh, uh, at least a couple of times in the design and many times in planning. So a brief introduction, why is infrastructure important? And with infrastructure, I, I mean mostly the civil infrastructure. If you take a container terminal, if you turn it upside down, whatever doesn't fall down is a civil infrastructure. And we talk a little bit about the differences in planning and design, what the ideal process is, and then what the challenges are in um, real life development of automated container terminals. And that's the fun part because there's a few kind of uh, experiences there. So a few words about Covey. Covey is an international um, design uh, company with, uh, we are consultants. Uh, we cover a many, uh, we cover a wide range of disciplines 
um, in civil engineering, but we include mechanical, electrical. And then in this slide, you'll see locations where we're active in Europe, Asia, North America, and Africa. And then uh, in the bottom is the ranking with ENR in different sectors, uh, bridges, uh, uh, solid waste, healthcare facilities, number five in ports and terminals, and number six, six in terms of revenues. So going on with the infrastructure now, why is it important? So one of the main reason is it's much more costly than a conventional container terminal uh, per TEU capacity. And this is because it has more advanced electrical supply, power supply. Uh, it does have uh, requirements for uh, grain beams on, on which the cranes are, the automated stacky cranes are rolling up and down, a more sophisticated pavement and so on and so forth. Uh, it is permanent for the economic life of the terminal. So uh, everything you build has to stay there forever and there's, um, it, it has to be, be decided in the beginning. There is not as much flexibility in, in the development and planning of a container terminal if it's automated because the automated stacking cranes, at least most of them are uh, uh, moving on steel rails, which are fixed. So the infrastructure, of course, affects operations and the efficiency of the terminal um, and how long the stacks are, how often you need to do maintenance, settlements, all sorts of things. And in, in order to give you a more um, uh, holistic uh, idea of what an automated container is, we say that it's like an industrial plan. The equipment, the infrastructure, software are seamlessly integrated and work together. So we must get it right the first time. That means um, it's expensive uh, and uh, causes delay to correct problems uh, during construction or up after the construction of the terminal of the civil infrastructure. And also because it's a very sophisticated system of um, uh, infrastructure that has a lot of electric uh, communication ducts passing through, uh, it's not something so standard that a contractor can figure it out. And it's not a very standardized um, a piece of infrastructure. And this will hear it many, many times um, that there's no cookie cutter solution. Or there's not off the shelf automated terminal. There's no plug and play container terminal, which is automated. So a few words about the difference between manual and automated. Um, in a conventional terminal, you have a big pavement, uh, not a lot of above ground uh, infrastructure, and then maximum operational flexibility. Humans make take uh, real time decisions during operations. You can move some equipment around uh, with relatively uh, low impact uh, to a certain degree. Uh, in an automated container, it has to be planned and designed to facilitate the smooth function of this robotic equipment, which is the automated stacking crane and also the automated horizontal transport throughout the life of the project. And these are robots that cannot see, they cannot hear, they only communicate through software and various uh, devices. So they, we have to program every single eventuality so that the software can deal with all these exceptions, all these cases. Otherwise, the safety mode is that the robot stops and waits for instruction, and that causes um, interruption in the operations. A PC on the, on the, as well, the terminal operating system must be developed to anticipate these scenarios. So it has to be flexible and expandable so that it can change to a certain extent afterwards or be calibrated. Now, civil infrastructure don't deal directly with the software and the integration, but it's a part of these systems. And uh, in the planning phase, all the business processes have to be taken into account because they affect where infrastructure goes. So in automated terminals, these integration requirements, as we see, it's much so stronger. So what we seen over years of experience in this development, there is a sort of ideal process, which is what we would like to have as designers and developers. 
first you begin with the planning, then we have the design and construction process. And then during the implementation uh, is where you have uh, the equipment coming in, integration, testing, commissioning, and then the startup phase where operations begins. And then you work out all your uh, uh, beginner kind of issues. And then slowly you have this ramp up phase until you get to the full operational capacity and productivity of the terminal. And ideally you want to have a core team of experts that uh, are staying throughout the project from the developer side, from the owner side. And then you bring in expertise and resources from different areas because nobody knows everything. The system is so complicated, it has so many aspects. That's impossible really to, for one or two people to know uh, all the small details that are involved. Additionally, and this is a very important slide, uh, somebody has to be aware about the development timeline in order to provide sufficient time. And I'll try to point a laser pointer here. Um, with gray uh, letters here, you see the manual terminal development where you build your business case, which is more of a, your operational target, um, your financials, uh, in about three months, then you go on with your planning, three to six months, and then you can develop the top side infrastructure in one or two years. And then um, you start the operations in less than a year, you have probably finished your ramp up. Now, semi automated and automated terminals takes longer. And um, together with the planning and the business case and the initial uh, preparation, uh, there is the infrastructure development. Uh, that includes the uh, installation, testing, and commissioning of the automated equipment and the integration of the software. And additionally, you have a one to two years period where you have your um, go live and your ramp up. So same with fully automated, I'll see, it might be even longer. Uh, what I try to say with that is uh, the development process doesn't stop at the go live date it's at the first commercial move. The development process continues afterwards. And integration engineering happens during at least two of the four stages of the development. As soon as you finish with your planning, the integration begins. So challenges. Uh, challenges I've seen and I've heard from colleagues here and there as we go from the plan uh, we go to the reality, right? So once we start building things and try to see how they work. Now, things I've seen before, one of them is say impacts of previous decision in the design. And that can be uh, quite significant. For example, the initial geometry can be decided during the environmental impact assessment and planning process. And then those things, because they take a long time to uh, to materialize and get approvals, get fixed in a way. And then after that, it is very difficult to, um, to change. And so you, somebody may end up with some kind of uh, decisions about the geometry, which doesn't uh, work later on as you work out your planning and you, you find out what you want. More and more, more than once I have seen, for example, Somebody wants to plan a, a container terminal, which they want to be automated in a land that is 300 meters wide. Now, this is a very difficult, a very challenging uh, width to build an automated container terminal. But somebody long time ago um, took that decision for that, and then you get, you're stuck with it. Then, of course, you have conflicts between contracts and interface as you go in the uh, procurement phase. And of course, there's always constraint due to local labor rules, who can do uh, what. They locally prefer construction phases and materials. And of course, there is budget, permits, and schedule. We saw this in 2008 with the financial crisis. Um, we'll see what will happen with the 2020 coronavirus effect now. Um, and uh, what is important to remember here, and we'll stress again and again, is there's no let's do what we do the last time approach because every single automated container terminal responds 
in the planning and the design in a lot of particular conditions, financial conditions, operational conditions, and uh, environmental conditions that are particular to that terminal. And uh, trying to take one layout from one point to another uh, leads to mistakes later on that are difficult to correct. Uh, and not only that, you start with something you think that's going to be, oh, we will try one of the previously tried and true layouts. And then because of various constraints and various requirements, you have to start modifying. And then what you thought was working because the shape has changed so much, doesn't work as well anymore. And that's why every terminal has to be planned properly. Um, now, impact of future decision to the design. Now, he's a, as infrastructure designers, our biggest challenge with automatic on terminal, automatic on terminal terminals is that we have to design for equipment, equipment loads that we did not know yet, because most of the times the infrastructure is designed before the equipment has been procured. And every equipment, every location has different environmental conditions. So therefore you cannot take general kind of ballpark equipment loads. We do some of that, but it has to always be verified when the equipment is procured and you have the actual loads with the actual wind on the side that the infrastructure has been, uh, is able to accommodate it. And these are big loads, for example, civil shock range, and they drive the uh, design of key walls and other structures. So it's not a minor thing. Um, of course, also the systems are different in terminal detection, uh, positioning systems, they require different position where the cameras go, uh, where the laser scanners and all that. Um, additionally, there are changes if the terminal is going to be from semi-automated to fully automated, there's a number of changes. And also uncertainty in the cargo mix. If we're going to have in the future more refrigerated containers, for example, where we're going to find space in the automated stack to put them. If the transshipment mix changes, how is that affecting our operation and our design? Uh, and so other challenges, for example, at least traditionally with every development is a conflict between key stakeholders. And with that, I mean, we have the port authority who usually pays for the infrastructure like the reclamation, dredging and the key walls. And of course they want to minimize how much they're spending, and so they try to minimize the reclamation of the keywords. That's why sometimes you see these 300 meter wide container developments because the Port Authority, you know, 10, 15 years ago decided that that was sufficient, and for a manual terminal, it's sufficient. But when they want to have an automated one, it doesn't fit there. Then the operator, the operator usually uh, pays for the equipment and the topside infrastructure, and of course. They want to minimize the operational expenditures and how much downtime we have for maintenance. And of course, the money man, as we call them, uh, basically they finance the early capex uh, investment. And of course, they want to spend as little as uh, upfront as, uh, as possible and have uh, revenues to pay off their debt as early as possible. And what does this mean is that they want to maximize the capacity because maximizing capacity means more revenues and also they want to minimize upfront investment. So the technical investigations that are necessary, maybe we don't put in the development cost, we throw it in the contractor, who knows. Um, so the effects on the infrastructure of all sorts of decisions that are taken in this phase are um, how much uh, soil improvement do you do your, uh, do you do on your reclamation because that affects the time to the market. If you have to do a preloading that takes three years, that's three years later earning revenues. Pavements, so you can have very expensive payment, but lower maintenance, uh, cheaper pavement with higher maintenance. And of course, the crane rail foundations that are different solutions, more maintenance um, versus and lower capex initially or bigger capex to um, lower maintenance cost. So these are, again, the balance between long-term savings and long-term operability. So it's good to have a flexibility in the design to the extent possible, but uh, that has additional costs and somebody has to bear those costs. Um, 
as we spoke before, the geotechnical investigations should be part of the EPC contract or do it, uh, or the owner has to do it. In the procurement, and there's different ways to procure, the civil infrastructure, you go design build or design build build the equipment, do you bundle the STS cranes with the uh, automated stacking cranes or the software you bundle together with equipment or not. So there's different ways that you can do it and all of those things have effects. And uh, what is the role of the port authority versus the operator in the top site infrastructure? That can be also a significant consideration. As designers and planners, we have to keep a, a balance with all the parties and integrate them, but we know that they have different interests. Um, so sometimes things change during the development and uh, introduce changes that are not anticipated. And this has happened many times. For example, the operator has not been selected when something has to be designed. The operator changes halfway the design. And this was the case, say, for the Khalifa port that I worked, Middle Harbor Terminal that uh, Mohan Nicol had worked for many, many years. Uh, LBCT and CUT changed, and LBCT remained. Now it's a different owner. Um, then sometimes what happens is the operator key staff changes, um, or the, the decision makers, during the construction or after the design, and then decisions that were taken before are being overturned. And this has happened, I've seen it happen. For example, location of refrigerated containers. There's usually two different uh, approaches. You either put them in the middle we are, or you put them in the end. One manager comes and say, I want it in the middle. The other manager comes and say, I want it in the end. Uh, sometimes there's a design that's finished for an automated terminal and then there's a key change stuff, key, key stuff change. And then this question, why we went automated is challenged and overturned. And the other way around from manual to automated and sometimes the, the designer has already costed in a design for manual terminal and he has to do an automated so um you know flexibility again is important um, and then uh, the designer has to be able to respond quickly so to conclude my presentation here an automated terminal is a sophisticated piece of equipment it takes a lot of decisions and so somebody has to uh, be aware that the infrastructure is one third of the story. Uh, then there is the software and then there's the equipment. Um, I don't think there is a, such a thing or I haven't seen an EPC contract for an automated container terminal, turnkey contract that somebody comes and builds it for you and gives the operator the key and you push the button and then the containers get unloaded. Uh, but uh, I've heard clients and potential clients think that once they hand out the construction contract, the job is done. Uh, so that's not how it is. Somebody has to allow sufficient time for proper planning, engineering, integration, and every decision has to be documented. There's no standard off the shelf automated terminal. Everyone is different. And then uh, the infrastructure needs to allow some flexibility because uh, otherwise, uh, decisions are taken later on or things that have to change because of market condition necessitate that and it's it's very hard to be breaking concrete and change things and with that i will uh, close my presentation here and i'll give back the uh, the mic to john i hope it works okay. okay this is what i have to say and uh, i'll go to mute here thank you very much Thank you, Dimitrios. A quite interesting presentation. Uh, a very important topic, like you said, is like the foundation or one third of, uh, of each project is related to infrastructure. And I already have some questions for you, but uh, we will take the questions after all the presentations from, uh, from our speakers and before the closing remarks, also with the hope that we can create a, a little bit of a, of a debate between the, between the three or four of you. Um, I'm going to pass the word now to uh, our next speaker. Our next speaker is coming from uh, Tratos, so it's an in-house speaker. Uh, he sits in uh, Germany in uh, his office in uh, Schüttorf, and his name is uh, Rainer Polemann. Uh, Rainer is the uh, European uh, sales manager for uh, Tratos, and uh, he's also the after sales manager, being key account for a lot of the major ports 
export accounts uh, worldwide. Uh, Rainer accumulates more than 12 years of experience working in this sector, and uh, his expertise relies on uh, cables for moving applications that could be cables for cable reels, stone, or spreader cables. Uh, he has participated in many projects uh, from the design stage to the commissioning phase. So he, he knows uh, really what's, what he's talking about. And uh, I'm going to give him the word and the floor now. Rainer, it's your turn. Please go ahead. Thank you, John. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for participating in this web seminar and Thank you to Dimitris to give us a macro overview about the situation. We as a cable supplier uh, are concentrated on the, on the micro infrastructure. So we, we, we use the, uh, we produce the electrical cables for Ukraine's. Just a small uh, uh, overview, Tratos is estimated in, uh, 1966, uh, uh, we produce cables since then in Tuscany. Um, uh, one of uh, our, our production is 100% done, made in Europe. So we produced our cables on different places. The heart of our production for reeling cables is in Tuscany. Uh, my topic of today is the electrical power and data transmission on terminals. Uh, next slide, please. Maybe we can, uh, uh, next slide, Enrico. Okay, just a small uh, overview of our Tratos world. This is our uh, main production in Tuscany. Uh, I am sure that most of the participants here in this webinar uh, already uh, our customers and informed in general about our products, what we do. I want to concentrate now uh, on, the, on the harbor business. So every cable that goes inside um, a harbor uh, is produced in Europe. We produce 100% of our cables in Europe. We start with the uh, in, in our production with um, raw material and finalize the cable completely in Europe. Next slide, please. So my topic of today um, is the, the data transmission on terminals. Uh, 25 years ago, harbor cranes, uh, normally the electrical cables um, have to power uh, the cranes and uh, the cranes, if they are moving, they are moving very slow. So the main work for the cable to be done is to transfer power. And uh, the only natural enemies for cables were mechanical damages by accidents, or at least uh, in long term, the ozone from the, from the sun that uh, affects directly the cable. So in general, the life, or let me say, uh, living as a, as a cable in the past was a uh, almost easy, easy job. Uh, nowadays, next slide, please. Nowadays, um, it is a little bit uh, massive, more challenging. So we start um, with uh, STS cranes unloading in the container business. Um, still, these uh, STS cranes drive very slow. Um, but uh, we already start a little bit to get more complicated. Uh, the, the cables on the monospiral uh, reels are very long because these uh, cranes operate on key sites. Um, still the main issues or the main complicated things for such uh, cables on the cranes are mechanical damages or the, uh, it's very important to have a good ozone protection. Also, some damages are caused by chemicals. So the cables that we produce had to be very resistant against uh, external effects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and now we come to uh, the really challenge that uh, Tratos as a uh, global player in this business is one of the uh, 
one of the few experts in, in producing these kind of cables. Uh, cables for automated stacking cranes that came up uh, about uh, 20 years ago with uh, speed increasing uh, to make sure that uh, unloading processes get uh, in the fastest possible time. So now uh, with these cables on automatic stacking cranes, we face completely new challenges. For sure, the, the uh, mechanical strength and the resistance against ozone is, is the same for this kind of cables, but uh, we have now automated stacking cranes that go up to speeds of 300 meters per minute. Since several years, the, the average speed of these cranes, and uh, Dimitrios for sure knows because he's, uh, he's uh, uh, giving recommendations uh, for, for such cranes, for crane speeds, um, that has a direct influence on the production of our product. So what we do as a crane manufacturer is we make these uh, cables uh, in a way that they are uh, mechanically resistant against high pulling tensions because, uh, okay, these, these cranes operating um, in 24 seven shifts uh, with a very, very high speed rolling on, rolling off this cable in two ways with a mid feeding point that gives an extra complication during the um, during the uh, unloading of containers. So the, the key point of our cable is that you never see our cable. So if, you, if there is a discussion about our cable or about cables in general, then something is, is wrong with the crane. And if the cable is not working perfect, so we have to make sure that our product is 24 seven uh, available and working very smooth. To do that, we uh, work in three steps. In the first phase, we work with companies like Ovi, Kobe, uh, in order to discuss in general uh, how the infrastructure is built. Uh, and the next step, we work with all major crane manufacturer uh, to make sure that new developments in electrical and for sure also in data transfer, which became lately a big discussion, um, that we are um, see products coming up and we implement that in our medium voltage cable. Um, we must say that uh, also the link to the main cable reel manufacturer is a very important thing. So you can see infrastructure people, crane manufacturer, cable reel manufacturer, and for sure different environments are an absolutely challenge for a product uh, that without this product, nothing is moving any centimeter. So uh, what, what we did in the, in the past is to bring all this, uh, uh, to, to bring our product to all these parties to make sure that we, uh, one hundred percent work with all different combinations of of cables. So uh, um, next slide, please. Um, so we can we can see also that we we do not start uh, in general uh, with with the with the product itself. We also follow during operations. Uh, maybe you can start the video that. Uh, um, we make sure that in the after sales um, situation, we are on site with our customer. Uh, we, we start uh, when, the, when the infrastructure project begins and uh, we do not stop until um, we are in the after sales market. So we also care for spare cables. We store cables for them. Um, and also, um, we make sure that the operation is, is going very smooth. So as a part of the crane, we, we, we permanently observe the, the situation uh, on site and we are always there for our customer worldwide. 
Um, so next slide, please. What we can expect from the future. What we can expect from the future at last is that cables will get uh, more data uh, in, in terms of fiber optics. We, will, we, will, we, we do already produce uh, cables with different fiber optic types. Uh, Dimitrios mentioned uh, uh, different cameras, different uh, um, information that need to be passed from the crane to the operation center, especially in fully automated um, uh, situations. These cables can transfer uh, data beside the power, beside the main uh, power supply, and they can transfer this data safe. So that means um, still a, a wire is, is the best connection to Ukraine. As a summary, I must say the future for the harbor crane will remain wired and not wireless. Thank you. I pass back to John. Thank you, Diana. That was a great presentation, a very good presentation. And uh, the product that you presented it looks looks pretty good, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it would work very well in any in any harbor around the world. Um, I'm going to move now into the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is is already really well known by uh, most of the people inside the uh, in ah lovely. Sorry, uh, our next speaker is uh, it's uh, well known. I was saying in the in the sector, he's been active for uh, many many years now. His name is Otonel Popesco, and is the president and chairman of Pima. So, Mr. Popesco is actually serving as chairman and the board of director in various stock exchange listed companies and private international companies like last minute Puntocom, uh, FEMA Group and uh, other, other kind of uh, companies. His expertise uh, relies on 38 years of experience in the port industry, initially with ABB, then he was CEO and co-founder of uh, Cabotech for a long time. And now he's, uh, well, for, since the beginning, I think, He's been chairing and, uh, and uh, being the president of the Port Equipment Manufacturer Association. Um, now we're going to get a little bit more in detail on uh, what is uh, happening. We're going to give. Uh, uh, we're going to get inside the uh, the uh, uh, current situation, and uh, for that we're going to give the word to Otonel. Otonel, good afternoon. Thanks a lot for uh, being with us, and I pass the word to you. And we are uh, we are looking forward to to hear what you have to say. Good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you very much in participating to this uh, webinar. I think uh, the times are challenging, and uh, this is the moment where everybody, at least from the port industry, should be together. So uh, let's go a little bit. I'm going to try to drive you and um, guide a little bit on the, the ports and terminals. We had some experts before talking about infrastructures, others about technologies in the ports. And uh, first of all, let's define a little bit what ports are we talking about? Because ports are not only containers. Ports are also dry bulk, they are liquid, they are roro, they are packs, they are cruise terminals. I think this is the, the scope of supply uh, once we are talking about ports. And uh, the investments in these ports are driven by some indexes, world indexes. Um, I don't want to make macroeconomy here, but just for you to, to know that there is a very important um, index, which is called the, Balt the Baltic Dry Index, uh, which exists since a long time. And um, this is considered by some people as the leading economic indicator, because it predicts the future economy, economic activity. This is uh, issued daily in London. So if you would like to understand what is going to happen in the port industry, how the people are going to invest there, I think it's, it's, it's an index, the BDI is something uh, just to give you an example, something which is going to, to be looked by the investors, because the investors are making the ports growing also, we should not forget that. Huh? So uh, the, the highest level of this uh, was in 2008 in May, was 11,700 points. Uh, and uh, end of uh, uh, 2019, so in December 19, last uh, December, was 1,000. So actually he's at 600. Okay, this just to give you an idea on what we are talking about. So there are others uh, indexes influencing ports and terminal investments. 
there is one which is called World Container Index. This is assessed by Drury. Uh, it's a composite of container um, uh, flight rates, uh, the freight rates in uh, on the eight major routes from the US, Europe, and Asia. Um, this one was in 2010 uh, the highest. Uh, it was in uh, 2018 at uh, around the 1,100 points. And uh, today it's around $1,500, uh, um, which is, I would say, not very bad. And this is also has a, an explanation because. Uh, today, even if the, the, the sea transportation is, is less, of course, uh, due to the, to the impact of the, uh, the restrictions in, many, in almost all the countries in the world, I would say that the, the, the maritime transportation kept the prices, I would say, pretty stable. Um, what was the situation before the impact of the coronavirus? I, I think this is something I'm going to tell you at the end what the day after, so this is before. So before we saw concentration on uh, shipping alliances, ocean alliance, alliance and 2M, we saw an increase of vessel capacity up to uh, over 20,000, uh, 22,000 TEU. We saw vertical integration uh, in between the logistic uh, regarding the shipping lines and the terminals. Uh, global operators, I think is no need to nominate them. There are five, six uh, from PSA, DP World and the others. And uh, we also saw a reduction of carbon print request by electrification, short power and automation. And um, I would like to stop a little bit uh, what was the situation on automation because we spoke a lot about automation. And I think automation is something which is going eventually to come back. But uh, this is some, because it has to do also with this uh, kind of uh, pandemics, which uh, I hope they are going to end up soon and uh, they are not going to come back soon. So just for your information before the automation, this is the, it's a case study, very short. Uh, what's happened before um, uh, December 2019? So first of all, around 1% of the terminals in the world were fully automated, so not a lot. And the drivers were basically the inefficiency costs in the terminals. Uh, uh, studies, they show that they were around 17 billion. Okay, this figure we can discuss, maybe 15, maybe 20, but this is the, the ballpark. And also, uh, the another driver was that you are going to reduce the workforce. They say there are around 45% less workers in the ports. And the forecast was, of course, that around 50% of the ports will automate. So this was the situation before December. In the meantime, end of December last year, they made some studies and they understood that before the, the, the virus, of course, what is the situation in the automation during the regarding the automation? So uh, the expectations were that the OPEX is going; they are going to be cut in between 25 to 55 percent. The studies made in last year they show that the OPEX they were only reduced of 15 to 35. The productivity in an automated terminal was supposed to be around 25, excuse me, 15 to 35 percent increase. At the end, the productivity was 7 to 15, so almost the half. The most per hour, which is very important, the expectations were 30. Automation, lower. So this was the situation a little bit before. What did we see after January 2020? We saw the situation we are now, where a lot of world governments, they were not prepared for what is happening. We saw Europe... Uh, in the total lack of coordination. You notice that things are moving much better now, but this is what it's happened since January until March, April. And what about the ports and terminal? This is where we are working. This is what we are talking about. We saw some IMO re uh, general recommendations, very general, but nothing concrete. So today there are now not big, I would say, inputs or regulations in the ports and terminal unless each individual port or shipping line is taking actions. Let's go a little bit to the day after. So I was saying earlier that um, the, this concentration on shipping alliances was there. I believe that this is going to continue. I also see that due to this slowdown of the economy or the stop of the old economy, we are going to face and we are facing already a recession. I cannot tell you how this is going to take. I hope 
not too long because the stimulus we receive from the U United, uh, excuse me, from the uh, US and the uh, EC, they're not going to last forever. So at the end, the people that are going back to work. So this is maybe two, three months. We have this support for two, three months, but at the end, we should know we are going back to work. It's no discussion about it. But how are we going to go back to work? That's the point also we need to think about. Social distancing, quarantine between the countries, unless we are going to find the vaccine, which is going to happen, I hope, soon. We are going to have another driver, is the disruptive consumption. A lot of things are going to change. Even if the human being is going to forget we have fortunately this good strength, we are forgetting what's happening. And we are always going to see what is going to happen, the nice things. Um, the supply chain will change. Um, there are going to be a lot of changes regarding the factories in certain countries moving back possibly, I'm saying possibly, to Europe or to United States. We are going to see, in my opinion, a quicker transition to digital revolution in e-commerce. We see it right now, once we are ordering everything to e-commerce, I would say most of us, this is going to accelerate, it's going to go faster. We are going to see a faster shift to e-mobility. E-mobility is important. This is happening not only in the, let's say in our day-to-day, -day, but it's going to happen also in, uh, in the port industry. The, we are going to see the deeper international uh, integration of the supply chain. Uh, the shipping lines already, they are owning terminals, owning or operating terminals. I believe they are going to be even more involved in the inland transportation to give a full package service to the customers. What is going to happen in the ports and terminal? This is the day after. As I said earlier, the concentration and these shipping lines alliances is going to go on. We are going to see um, a slowdown in the increase of vessel capacity. Again, this is my personal opinion. We are going to see a lot of retrofit instead of new terminals or projects. This is again due to the lack of money and because the money, all the funds are going to put in restarting the economy and possibly this is not the main priority. Um, we are going to see the um, IT and the digitalization technologies in the ports, which are going to increase. I'm, I'm sure that this is going to increase strongly. Service and maintenance are going to increase also in the ports um, because everybody is going to extend the lifetime of the equipment. And um, electrification, I have any doubt, no doubt that is going to be stronger. This is because it was part of the reducing carbon print and also now the people, they are aware of what we are doing to this planet. And I think electrification do, done in the, in the right way is going to affect positively the, the development of ports. Um, automation, just to go back a little bit on when we started with the Dimitris. Um, I think that for the time being, the automation, at least in the, let's say, I would say in the um, initially, I should call that initially, um, is going to decline. So um, we are not going to make a lot of automation because there is the money now is going to invest it, to be invested in other things. I'm not saying that it's going to be stopped because automation, as I said earlier, it is something we, everybody wants to make automation. And um, I also see that this is the right moment when we need to follow our customers. I think following your customers and our customer is key. Now our customers, they need us. I'm speaking about the ports and terminals, but not only about that. So these are a little bit my, my uh, this is, these are my views. And um, again, I'm open for questions whenever you uh, would like to place them to John. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Otonel. Thanks for your, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I think we have some questions for on the floor and I also have some, some comments myself. Uh, I also want to invite uh, to the to the table uh, uh, Dr. Maurizio Brajani uh, before he also makes the closing remark. In case he also wants to to participate in the in the short debate, we will 
we will have now uh, uh, at this particular moment in time. Uh, the first question we've got is uh, for uh, Dimitrios, and it's a question from uh, Luis Canto. He asked in uh, particular, he says, based on your experience, uh, Dimitrios, uh, the infrastructure flexibility will lead to variation orders of which percentage? Are we speaking about 10, 15% or more than this? Yes, okay. Um, to answer this question, we can uh, see infrastructure flexibility in two ways. There is infrastructure flexibility that you can build in at the planning stage of the container terminal. For example, you can allow for the percentage of uh, empty, uh, for percentage of uh, refrigerated containers to increase and that uh, you can allow that within the infrastructure you can build in certain ways so that if you need to put more refrigerated drugs for example you can do that and in the planning stage you can integrate a lot of flexibility which um, may increase slightly your investment cost uh, but not much and then that will not lead to variation orders because you have planned for it and you have foreseen that and so it's not a last minute change is flexibility you build in so this is one type of infrastructure fle flexibility now let's look into the variation orders there is uncertainty in all the projects and as i explained earlier there is a lot of things that happen from um, new market information to change of uh, key decision makers now, uh, if uh, you finish your planning with something and then you proceed to your design stage, uh, then two things can happen. This uncertainty with a number of things. The biggest one is usually the geotechnical factor. Uh, so you, in this case, uh, you may have some changes in your design because you found that uh, the soil is not as good as you expected. In general, if you um, account for that, uh, that may increase your uh, total infrastructure cost, not so much for the design. Um, it's difficult to say whether that can be 15 or 10. I, I think that a good, a well-planned terminal and a well-informed uh, well, um, well design where you have spent some money up front to do some good geotechnical investigations not lead to big variation orders because you reduce uncertainty with early studies. Um, so that should not be a, a big variation order because the more information you have in the beginning, you can foresee those things and you could design for. For, but for example, there are cases where the market condition change and then you change your development plan. So instead of building, you know, I don't know, 400 meters of key wall now or two birds, you build one bird. This is a significant change. Or if you have to change your layout, all the top side infrastructure then has to change. And this is something to be aware of because people think that, okay, we'll make our stacks a little bit shorter, no big deal. Well, all the electrical ducts are connecting to the end or the middle of the cranes, like Reiner said. Um, all the drainage infrastructure has to change. The electrical infrastructure has to change. The uh, beams of where the crane rails are sitting, all those things. And these lead to a new design. Uh, the same thing if you decide finally in a hypothetical situation, you finish your design, you do your bill of quantities and you you see the total bill and then it's, it's too big and then you have to make adjustments to reduce what you built to your budget. Then uh, the design, the, the, then the, uh, the changes are going to be significant, both to the design uh, effort and to the construction effort. So to, to, to give a, a good answer is that the more you plan that flexibility into your planning phase and the more you study it and you get some cost estimates preliminary, at least in, in terms of uh, preliminary but informed cost estimates in the preliminary stage of the project, which is the planning and the concept design, then the less you have to change and the less you have to pay later on for an anticipated 
um, variations in the soil conditions or in the market situation or changing the operational concept. So, you know, it can be very little for to very big. It depends on how big the change is. I hope this answered the question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dimitrios. Uh, any other of uh, any other people from the from the floor that want to say something? Maurizio, you wanted to say something? I really have a question for Dimitri and uh, and Otnel, uh, because I, the question is, how much in your experience uh, uh, the decision between semi-automatic, fully automatic, just manual, the port should be and should organize. How much is of the percentage of this decision is a political decision? And in particular, in what uh, Ottonel have just uh, analyzed uh, and help us to get inside of this uh, new situation that all of us, we are living the, uh, according to the coronavirus, how much this percentage will be more in the future, a political decision. So in all the factors that you have just described, Dimitris, I really could, uh, for just an understanding point of view of me, it's how much really the decision to go through uh, one kind of port and to another kind of port, it's not just uh, uh, technical or economical, but it's really just a simple political decision. Yes, um, I, I would say I have seen both economic and political decisions, but the difference in cost is quite significant for manual and automated. And uh, then one has to have, hopefully, a, a well-defined business case to be able to support the expenditure. And the expenditure in automated terminals is in the beginning of the development because the infrastructure is expensive. So upfront, you have to spend more money than in a manual terminal. And so uh, whether your motives may be political, it depends on the, the operator or the port authority who is the decision maker. Sometimes, you know, if the port authority is a decision maker, maybe there's more politics involved. If the operator is the decision maker, maybe there's less politics and more business. Um, but the difference in cost is significant and the payment is upfront. So whoever makes that decision needs to have a, a, a backed up business plan uh, because the financing of that is, uh, is important. And uh, on the political side, this is not something that goes to schools and hospitals, as we usually say, right? Um, and, and, and that's how I would approach that. Uh, it's just that whatever the reason it is, it's a significant investment and you need to, to, to have a, a well thought reason for it. Okay, so um, let me give uh, also my, my point of view. Uh, I would say that um, there are two issues as Mauricio said, one is political and the other one is uh, investment money. Um, no discussion that uh, container terminal or fully automated or semi-automatic is much more costly. I heard about figures, I wouldn't like to throw figures like that from the blue, um, but not all the ports, they can do that on terminals. It's impossible. They don't have the money. So we are going back to the five, six big in the world, which have the money to do that. And the point is, are they going to invest something like that in the next two years? My opinion, they are going to be very careful. But this is my opinion. I, I'm not uh, uh, playing with the money with, uh, without and taking decisions. So um, politically, uh, is also a very tough decision. Um, simply because, um, as I said earlier, the expectations are to reduce, let's say, the, the workers in the terminal. And um, even if you might have, might have some efficiency, at the end, you are going to reduce the people. And the, the challenge in the next, for the ports, and not only in the next years, due to what is happening now, is how we are going to fight unemployment. And this is, this is a tough issue. This is a pure political issue. So coming back a little bit to the question, I think yes, automation is valid. Automation is not going to be uh, soon. In uh, at least we are speaking about uh, very large companies with a lot of backup uh, and return on investments, which are extremely long. Remember that 
And not only that, the shipping lines, and remember that the Baltic Dry Index I discussed a little bit earlier, this is the guideline of how we are going to invest in the ports. So remember, this is a key factor, it's a key economic indicator. If this is going, it means that, the, which, as I said earlier, this is um, measuring, I would say, the, the cost of shipping costs. If you are losing money in shipping the goods, you are not going to invest in ports and terminals. It's simply like that. It's a, it's a simple equation. If this is going to be back better, in this case, yes, we can reinvest in ports and again, we can make automation. So automation, I would say, is a, at my opinion, is at the end of the process today and at least in the next one to two years. Okay. Thank you, Otonel. We have more questions from the floor. The next one is from uh, Caro Okpure. Uh, and it's again, it's a question for Otonel. And his question is, how soon after the European pandemic are factories going to be relocated back to Europe into your opinion to mitigate this supply chain risk? So he, he takes as a fact that the factories are going to be relocated back to Europe, at least some of them. I, I don't know what is your take on that, Otto. Yes, I, I can answer that. First of all, I don't have the crystal ball. These are uh, tendencies, these are trends. I believe that they are going to be, and this is everybody is scared about, take this example with the masks. So everybody is saying we don't have masks in our countries. This is a very, uh, I would say, it's not a strategic um, item. A lot of uh, politicians, they are thinking to that. I'm not speaking about the US, also in Europe. And you heard what uh, some of the presidents uh, of uh, some countries in Europe, they, they recently say that we are going to bring back. I cannot tell you when it's going to happen and at what scale is going to happen that a lot of factories, at least some strategic factories are going to be uh, brought back to, to Europe. This is a big challenge. It's a big challenge because we are doing that now since more than 25, 30 years. And you don't make this shift like that from day one. It's very difficult. It's very complex. Uh, and in um, the meantime, we should not forget something very important, that the Far East, including China, it's a huge market. It's a big market. So if we are doing something like that in bringing everything home in the Western countries in the US, you are forgetting one, maybe one of the largest markets in the world, which is the Far East. So it's a, it's a very important balance. I'm not a politician. I do not know what is going to happen. But again, there are tendencies and there are speeches and there are inputs coming from a lot of politicians. At the end, the politicians, they are not taking the decisions. The decisions are, decisions are going to be taken by the shareholders of some, some, some companies. And at the end, maybe the politicians, they are going to try to drive us, do that or do that. But today, I do not have a an answer on the date or on the scale. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we have more questions. Uh, another one is coming from uh, Chandran, Chandran Ramasamy, um, and he's. It's, it's more kind of a comment than uh, than a question itself. Uh, he wants to know if it would be possible to have a database of ship to shore LTE and other type of uh, crane that needs revamping with electrification. Uh, or upgrading all crane systems, uh, as pointed out by uh, by uh, Ortonel. Um, more assets will be a stretch or extended the life of uh, cycle of cranes during current situation rather than than buying new equipment. Uh, since uh, he mentioned also that it came after your uh, after your topic, Ortonel, I, I will I will pass the the, the question to you. It's, it's a quite interesting topic, the, just to complement a little bit the, the question from, uh, from Chandran, what you've been mentioning about uh, uh, retrofitting. Uh, do you think that retrofit could, uh, you say, you've said that automation is not going to be, let's say, is not going to advance on the current situation. Do you think inside that retrofit, automation of brownfields could have a uh, um, space? Well, the brownfield is it's another, it's another topic. So the brownfield, again, sorry to be a little bit uh, in, the, in, the, in the topic here, they are going to be postponed now. We are going to speak now what we are going to work, we are, work, we are going to work with what we have on hand. On hand, we have the ports and terminals, and there are quite a lot. 
to remember that the, the ship industry, the shipping industry is going to, is suffering and is going to suffer in the next years. Of course, the brownfield terminals, they're not going to pop up like that. They're going to be slower. The investments are going to be slower. And today, I think this is not the, 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 the point. Let's start to make a brownfield terminal. The point is how we are going to use our existing terminals better. This, this is the key. And as we all know, speaking and going back to automation, you cannot make an automated terminal like that from the blue if it was not initially designed to be automated. So retrofitting means, as I said earlier, electrification, even if a lot of uh, cranes are electric, not all, I'm speaking about the ship to shore, we are going to see more uh, RTGs electrified, and I'm sure for that, and these are lower investments compared to uh, to let's say change and make automation in all the terminals. And uh, also something which is linked to the, to the shore power, shore power of ships, which started maybe 15 years ago. This is going to continue, I'm sure of that. Because the people now they are seeing what is happening around their houses, around the environment. Uh, and they're going to say, who is the toughest polluter? Are the ships in the world? This is, this is the reality. It's not a, mm -hmm. it's not a, a number coming. From, from, from the blue. So at the end, this is going to go on. So retrofitting, yes, uh, maintenance, as I said earlier, and servicing is going to increase. Again, these are my opinions. And uh, also short power for, uh, for the ships. I, I kind of agree with you. And, and I want to complement that with, if we got time with a little bit of uh, a, a complimentary question on that. But before that, I'm, I'm quite interested on, on, on this particular topic, which is, uh, existing terminal automation uh, to know to open the, the, the question to the floor um, in particular I'm interested uh, to know from uh, Dimitrios uh, whether you think that could uh, kind of uh, compensate the lack of investment on new greenfields and also I want to I want to hear from uh, from uh, Maurizio uh, Ryan if you want to, to comment uh, something on this topic. Yes, I, from my experience, I would say the, for existing terminals, although there are cases where there is a conversion from manual to automated, there are well-documented cases here and there. Some of them are proceed, uh, proceeding. Uh, the, maybe, as Don Mel mentioned, there is also the other option of, instead of going with automation, doing some electrification on RTG cranes and elsewhere. And that reduces at least uh, changes the, the reduces the emissions, uh, changes a little bit the operations, um, and so that may be a slightly easier option to implement that uh, automation. And why? Because automations, as we mentioned, are three parts: is infrastructure, um, it's equipment, and it is software. And in a existing terminal, you already have some infrastructure and most importantly, you have certain software. If you're gonna introduce automation in the cranes there, the old software has to speak with the new software, we have to adapt it. So it's a, it is a challenge, whereas if you just introduce electrification, there's less of a challenge there. But uh, having said that, there are well-documented cases where uh, there is an initial there's conversion to electrification with the plan to automation with the plan to extend automation in the existing phase as well and convert the terminal to fully automated at some point in the future. So to summarize, you can do both, but it seems like it may be easier um, to have electrification at some point on your existing equipment. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a quick comment. Have, um, I Go ahead. Have, sorry, I just uh, wanted to, to add it to one point on the conversation, if I can. Uh, I agree in uh, what uh, a lot of things you have said, but uh, I think that the results here, are in, we are in front of big challenges. And those big challenges, that is the pandemic that we are living, all of us, that, that we are experience, experiencing in this moment, all of us, this pandemic also open question that there are more that have never been explored. Um, even though a recession is coming, that is an evidence, uh, a lot of factory, they are shut down, a lot of factory, um, they are closed for, uh, for contingency reason of this uh, pandemic. 
and that is an evidence that sooner or later we have to go back, we are going back to the normality. Um, but the question that I have, and the question that I think that is still on the market, is still on, is still on the floor for all of us is this. In some case, uh, this pandemic has showed the, the, the weakness point, the point that uh, we care more, thanks God, is the life of the people. And people in this moment in the ports are doing a great, a, mass, a massive great job to keep goods carry on, to move goods from one side to another side of the world and uh, help people as us to stay at home and to receive those goods. But those operators inside of the port that deserve all our attention are also the ones that are putting their uh, life, if you want, a certain point at risk that they need personal protection to do their job. So in automatic uh, ports, of course, they reduce that uh, number of the people that you have inside of the port and also can open a possibility to keep the port operating even, do, even during a massive pandemic, reducing the risk of health, uh, the usual risk that when you have people inside of a port and you have a, a machine, automatic machine that are moving, that is always a health risk. And that is the reason why the port has a structure so strong in that healthy and safety uh, and the environmental, but also we have another high risk that is a pandemic that can be repeated in the future. So I agree with Otonel that it will be a big decision, political decision to have a fully automatic port because you have less people that they're working in full automatic port. And in particular in the future, potential uh, unemployment that is, uh, is coming, that is an evidence, just data of you, from UK what we call national scheme. Uh, last, uh, until last month, there were only 100,000 people registered to the national scheme to have, uh, to declare that they are unemployment. Just in the last months, and millions of people, of British people, they have just registered on the national scheme. So basically they declare themselves that they are out of job. So it's an evidence that this number are increasing due to the actual condition. And uh, of course, it's a political decision, but there is also another decision, efficiency decision for and help and increase the healthy. So it could be that in the future, uh, we could have more automatic ports just to keep the situation ongoing to as a plan B of a potential new uh, coronavirus or new disease. That is the only thought that uh, I had that I would like to put on, on the floor. So Maurizio, your, your, uh, what you're saying, if I'm, if I'm understanding you well, it's, uh, um, I'm taking a little bit the, uh, the uh, speech of uh, Ortonel. He mentioned that uh, before this crisis, we had some drivers, certain drivers uh, driving the, uh, the uh, decisions on automation. Um, no doubt, those drivers are still on the table, but now you've brought to the table another drivers that they were also there before, but perhaps now they are getting stronger or let's say more important like you speaking about uh, health and safety it was already there but now you've brought to the table also uh, reliability the, the the potential risk of a new pandemic um are we facing not an immediate change or a revolution but are we facing a change on balance between the existing drivers to make decision will we face a different balance on drivers to make decision on automation. It's, it's, I think that's maybe perhaps a question to, to you, maybe Otonel want to, to say something about that. Yes, uh, um, go ahead, Otonel. Maurice. Oh, no, no, Otonel first, oh, absolutely Otonel first. So um, again, the, the balance in taking a decision like that, sorry to say it again, is driven by money. If you have money, you can take a political decision. I would like to make it automated, but if I don't have the money, I can do it. Now it's easy because everybody is borrowing money at zero interest. There are stimulus, it's fine, it's feasible. Long-term, this is not feasible. So I think that the economical um, challenge here is to have a return on investment, which is valuable, which is, is going to have a return. Otherwise, you're not going to make it automated, automated terminals. Back to the safety. Safety is, I would say, is number one priority for all. Health is number one. We can have 
a lot of workers in the terminals well protected, as we were supposed to have some in our hospitals today. Huh? Now, maybe the situation is back on track. So we can protect that. I don't see it's, it's, a, it's a big issue here. Um, I'm, as I said earlier, I do not see automation in the future, in the next years, popping up. This is my opinion. Um, there is something I wanted to add on what we said earlier, and this one is going very well on your, on your um, I would say, because you are a manufacturer of cables. Um, during the automation, uh, before, I would say, and even now, uh, the virus, uh, the data quality, so a lot of inefficiencies in the automated terminals are linked to the data quality. It's a poor monitor uh, of uh, diagnosed material and so on. And this is why everything, a lot of things are going through the, through the cables. So this is something I would recommend if I would be a cable manufacturer to work more. It's not only optical fiber, there are other devices which can be uh, transmitted through a cable. And I think this is another issue which is linked also to the, not only electrification, but also data transmission in the terminal. And one of the data transmission way it's, it is also uh, through, uh, through a cable. Thank you, Otton. And I'm, I'm, if you allow me, gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to continue a little bit with some other uh, questions from the floor, like uh, this one from uh, Lauren uh, Shaparak. Yeah. Uh, John, sorry, only to sorry. reply to Otonel uh, quick, quickly. I just believe that uh, I agree with Otonel that, of course, everything has been the major driver is still money. But uh, uh, what is going to happen? Let's let's talk about uh, something that we know very well, Euro. So uh, all the country, all the company in this moment, they are basically relying in uh, in the government intervention. And whatever is going to happen in, the, in a month's time, in two months' time, when uh, on six months' time, when the vaccine will be available, and to reopen, to reopen, to restart this economy will need a massive support from all the governments, in particular, every single state. Um, I think that one of the drivers that is going to drive uh, for the future will be the uh, the, calco the management risk of pandemic. Um, I have to tell you, I want to share with you, for example, that the uh, United Kingdom since 2007, they got it, a pandemic plan action. Those pandemic plan action has been uh, uh, reduce due to the fact in 2011. But until 2011, for example, United Kingdom has got it a pandemic plan in action and with the high risk of monitoring those pandemic act. And that is going to come back. And if it is going to come back, one of the driver will be to reduce the risk. And to manage or reduce the risk means to increase automatization everywhere because that is the only way that we can keep the industry and the production go through floor, in particular in a situation as a siege as we are now. Um, I think that, that that will be one of the driver. Of course, those driver needs to be supported by uh, government money because otherwise, as Otunel says, the private is not going to put money because there is no money available on all private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Maurizio. Uh, so now I will continue with the next question. Uh, as I said, is uh, this one is uh, again for uh, Ortonel uh, Popesco. It says during the coronavirus pandemic, as you mentioned, the economy has a slowdown, and I guess the demand for port services has decreased. So the question is, how the port's operational capacities are affected by this, and how quickly could they reach the potential after the lockdown? of countries will end gradually. Thank you. Otomel. Well, first of all, I don't have the, the crystal ball. Huh? Um, I must say that um, the service now is it's, it's vital. So we need to, so the, 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 the ports today, they have the capacity to handle everything. But because there are less people available, of course, <laughs> there, there is less Call it capacity, and you can see that in the trends in all the ports in the world. 
not only because the shipping lines are slowing down, but also because the ports, they are not available to receive the, the, the goods. And uh, I, think, I think someone of you just mentioned earlier that there are ports where we waited. I think Mauricio said that we, we have uh, uh, stacked in, a, I don't know, in what port, uh, in, uh, in what country, uh, masks or equipment, medical equipment since uh, two weeks. Again, um, we also need people to do that. Um, I don't have the, the crystal ball, and I want to repeat that. Um, I think we are prepared. The ports are prepared. Uh, the ports must make maintenance, because if you are not maintaining your equipment, which is standing there, is not moving, you are not going to start it like a car uh, immediately. So you need to, to perform that. And this is, this, is, this is a little bit my answer. So service, I mean, it's, it's evident. Maintenance has to do also with the service. And the, the suppliers of equipment for ports, I think all are committed as far as they can have access to their, spa, to their factories. Today, in some countries, we can even not have access to the, to the spare parts. As far as we can do that, so the ports are going to work smoothly. Uh, just to make a, a general comment here, um, I think this pandemic is, um, of course, um, making us a lot of thinking out of the box and what it can happen. But this is not the, um, the asteroidical stuff. It means that we didn't have something in our head and the world is going to stop. The world is coming back. It's no discussion with the virus or without the virus. It's going to take longer because this vaccine is not going to come maybe in the next uh, three months. It has a little bit longer time. The treatments and also what our governments they did, they were gaining time. This is the issue. All of this lockdown is based on that, that we are now over, um, let's say, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are blowing our hospitals uh, intensive care units. And of course, to stop the epidemic, and this is working. You saw what China, China is back in track. In track. There are new cases in some countries like Hong Kong or Singapore, but it's contained. So the lock, this lockdown was very good. I strongly believe that the ports today, to, to conclude in this topic, the ports today, they are available, they are ready, and they have the capacity. I don't have any doubt on that. Supporting them with some maintenance and service, of course, if this is going to take longer than we foreseen, is going to help a lot. I agree, Otonel. Thanks for your uh, contribution. It's, it's time to end. We only got 10 minutes to go. Uh, we've got more questions from the floor, but uh, uh, like I said, uh, uh, we, need to, we need to close soon this uh, session. I, I want to, to have a, a quick uh, question of, um, of my own, and it's, it's a question to the table, okay? Um, we've got the uh, decarbonization and environmental agenda. We've got several actors and, uh, and uh, bodies in Europe asking to, let's say, reshape European economy regarding the, uh, uh, or let's say, based on the, this famous European Green Deal. No? Um, it was a big, strong trend on ports to electrify. Uh, it was a big trend on ports and a lot of pressure from the, let's say, from the, from the governmental bodies to reduce pollution on ports. Um, I want to know uh, also for Dimitri, because he mentioned in the very beginning that the cost infrastructure of a greenfield is higher because the use of the electricity in an automated terminal. And um, my question to the floor is, um, what is going to be the role of electricity in the terminals of the future? Do you still see it will go this, this trend? It will, it will deepen? We will see more and more fully electric terminals? Or do you, are you afraid that it will uh, stop at a certain point due to the lack of investment? Who wants to start? Uh, I can start with this one. Okay. Uh, I think we will see more and more electrification because electrification reduces the emission at the point where they are emitted. For example, the trucks running around in the terminals, they produce emissions. Now, if we can make them hybrid or electric, then we reduce the sources of emission in a place where we have already a severe problem. And this is why we saw, for example, in Los Angeles, where there is a lot of money that was invested in electrification and alternative fuels 
with the objective to reduce emissions. And you want to reduce emissions where the problem is, which is basically at the port side. And because behind the port, there is people, there's families that live there and they get affected immediately by the emissions of the trucks. They have children that they get asthma and all those things. So because all those things are very important, it's very uh, crucial to reduce the emissions where they are produced. And for that, I think we're going to see more electrification in that sense. Thank you, Dimitri. Any other comment? Yes, um, just a, a quick one. Regarding the electrification, as I said, of course, is uh, reducing carbon print. No discussion about that. Um, but you should know, why, when do we make the first ERTG? The first ERTG was made in China uh, more than 10 years ago, I think 12 years ago. But this was not due to any pollution issue. It was due to a specific cost. It was cheaper to run it electric than, rather than diesel. It's simply like that. So this is another factor. Electricity is also cheaper. Of course, environmentally, it's number one. No discussion about that. But it's also cheaper. Now, maybe with the, with the diesel which is, or the oil, which is going at uh, 15 to 10 bucks, maybe it's a different story. But at this time, this was the, the main driver. It was not started, the electrification of the RTGs, it was not started because pollution. It was started in China because the cost issue. Simply like that. Thank you, Antonel. Uh, Ryan and Maurizio, do you want to comment something? Because we're running out of time. I really want to, to, give, uh, to give the award to, to Maurizio Rajani, uh, which, by the way, I did not introduce in the very beginning. But as you all know, uh, Maurizio is the CEO of the Tratos Group. And uh, he is also currently the consul of uh, San Marino for uh, United Kingdom and um, Northern Ireland. So, Maurizio. Uh, Briefly, I pass you the word for a quick uh, uh, final words, uh, some remarks, and then I can uh, I can close this uh, this session. Before I want to apologize because we have a large large uh, queue of uh, questions, but we've been already here for one hour and a half, and we will have other opportunities to to continue. Please, Mauricio. So first, I would like to thanks to all the participants to this uh, first entity of seminar that Tratos wanted to put in place. We don't want to close that uh, uh, this uh, seminar just with uh, uh, a solution. I think that there's been raised a lot of question and, uh, and they are very interesting question. One of that question that they are really interested, for example, for Pat O'Leary, that it, it says, does automa uh, automa uh, automation not increase the risk in case of future crisis? as a total shutdown may occur without the personnel being able to interview as the knowledge has been lost to the automation. So it's a very important question. Um, it looks like that is in contradiction with what I made uh, as a comment before, but I think that in reality, what we have seen today is, uh, is an interest to, to take more time and to deeply analyze uh, this subject the subject of uh, understanding better automation and port. I just wanted to as a deeply remark that I think that that is the first tentative and we need, uh, we are going to go through more on these uh, seminars. I'm pleased to announce that on the next panel, on the next time, on the next panel, we are going to have also uh, the former Secretary of State of United Kingdom, Greg Clark, uh, and actual the chairman of the Inno Innovative Committee, um, the committee of the UK Parliament as one of our panelists. And I would like also to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dimitris and Antonel for their great uh, uh, insight, the opportunity to understand better uh, this matter. Uh, in particular, Dimitris, thank you for let's understand the, the base and the numbers and what is important on automatization and uh, manual. So the different and also the insight that you gave Otonel, thanks for all your experience that is always, um, is, you are a great expert of this market and thanks also for the punctuality and the number, also the story behind uh, the insight. I want also to get, take this opportunity only to say thanks to all the doctor and nurse and the medical operators that in this moment they are fighting for us. They, this is a difficult moment. But I would like also to take the opportunity to thanks all the ports operators because 
without their job, daily job that they are operating the ports, all the economy that is still uh, helping the nation to carry on and helping the, our doctors to do their job, to bring goods and to help people to have the goods available will be not impossible. Because what we cannot forget is that 80% of the world economy go through ports. That is the most important thing that we have to remind ourselves. So I want really to present my, our tribute to what they are doing. You are doing a great job and you are carrying on to do it a massive job. And as I said, what we want as a Tratos is to don't close the door, don't close, don't give a final answer, but just open, uh, open a discussion and to invite all of you to the next event that we are going to do it to carry on the discussion. And we're going to start it from this point that has been raised, exactly the point that uh, Pat O'Leary has raised as a question. I think that that question deserves it to carry on on the next uh, uh, event. Thanks a lot for everyone. Thank you, Maurizio. I can only make uh, mine your own uh, your own words. Uh, so thanks to all the thanks to all the speakers. As Maurizio said, uh, this is just the first of a series of uh, webinars that will be uh, hosted by uh, Tratos. So please stay tuned to our uh, social media channel. Please stay tuned to our newsletters. We know you are not going anywhere during the next days, so stay tuned, take care, have a happy, but especially have a safe Easter and take care of yourself. Thank you very much. See you next time.